Good afternoon. It's Thursday, September 10th. I'm Laura Cornfield, and this is IBA News, broadcasting from Jerusalem. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met this morning with British Prime Minister David Cameron at his residence at 10 Downing Street. At the start of the meeting, Netanyahu said he is ready to restart stalled peace negotiations with the Palestinians without preconditions. Netanyahu told his host he was willing to begin talks immediately. The Prime Minister told Cameron that the Middle East is disintegrating under the twin forces of militant Islam, the Sunnis led by Islamic State and the militant Shiites led by Iran, and that he hopes the two nations can work together to fight off those forces. Netanyahu took the opportunity to discuss relations between the two countries in the field of technology, saying that the future lies in innovation and that both Israel and Britain have a great deal to offer, especially if they work together. Ahead of Prime Minister Netanyahu's arrival at number 10 Downing Street, there were competing rallies nearby on opposite sides of the street. Some 300 anti-Israel demonstrators held signs calling the Israeli leader a war criminal and demanded his arrest. Hundreds of pro-Israel demonstrators were also on the scene and there were minor scuffles as the police stepped in to keep the sides apart. unwelcome and that we are very, very unhappy about the fact that our Prime Minister is dealing with such a terrorist country that constantly bombs Gaza, West Bank, constantly builds settlements on Palestinian land. If I disagree with Prime Minister Cameron, that doesn't make me anti-British. That makes me having a political view. Disagreeing with Prime Minister Netanyahu, is, there's nothing wrong with that at all. But disagreeing with the simple existence of the only Jewish state in the world, that is where I draw the line where I have a problem. I mean, why isn't anyone here going about to Syrian leader Assad? Why Netanyahu? I can't believe it. People are dying, dying terribly. They're all walking out of Arab countries to Europe because they're not free in their Islamic countries. In other news, a rebellion by conservative Republicans in the Congress has delayed the first vote on the Iran nuclear deal. Republicans demanded that President Obama provide more information from secret clauses of the deal. Meanwhile, thousands of people attended a rally, a rally on Capitol Hill organized by a coalition of opponents of the deal led by the Tea Party. As Congress debated the deal between Iran and world powers, Republican presidential candidates Donald Trump and Ted Cruz were outside addressing the rally. If Iran gets a nuclear weapon, the single greatest risk is they would take that nuclear weapon. They would put it on a ship anywhere in the Atlantic and they would fire it up straight into the air, into the atmosphere. They would set off what's called an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse. It would take down the electrical grid on the entire eastern seaboard and kill tens of millions of Americans. Never, ever, ever in my life have I seen any transaction so incompetently negotiated as our deal with Iran? And I mean never. This deal will not allow Iran to um, have a nuclear bomb, but it will legitimize Iran as a nuclear threshold state, which is almost as bad as having the bomb. It means they just basically have to turn a few screws. And if Iran is allowed to achieve that status, then its neighbors in the Middle East are going to want to achieve that same status to protect themselves. And so it's going to lead to nuclear proliferation, and that's my main concern. It's putting money in our enemies' hands, and they will turn around and use it against us. It's, it's no good for the United States of America. If nothing else, we got nothing out of the deal. We didn't even get our hostages out of the deal. So it's just a bad deal all the way around. I came because we are from the Middle East, and we are this deal because this deal is going to involve the terrorism in the Middle East. And for the safety of the people in the Middle East, we are against this deal. We are against any, uh, like any terrorist country like Iran to have the nuclear deal. 
Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton defended the Iranian nuclear deal, calling it a win for diplomacy. I believe that the success of this deal has a lot to do with how the next president grapples with these challenges. So let me tell you what I would do. My starting point will be one of distrust. You remember President Reagan's line about the Soviets, trust but verify. My approach will be distrust and verify. We should anticipate that Iran will test the next president. They'll want to see how far they can bend the rules. That won't work if I'm in the White House. I'll hold the line against Iranian noncompliance. That means penalties even for small violations. Keeping our allies on board, but being willing to snap back sanctions into place unilaterally if we have to. Working with Congress to close any gaps in the sanctions. Right now, members of Congress are offering proposals to that effect, and I think the current administration should work with them to see whether there are additional steps that could be taken. So here's my message to Iran's leaders. The United States will never allow you to acquire a nuclear weapon. As president, I will take whatever actions are necessary to protect the United States and our allies. I will not hesitate to take military action if Iran attempts to obtain a nuclear weapon. And I will set up my successor to be able to credibly make the same pledge. We will make clear to Iran that our national commitment to prevention will not waver depending on who's in office. Former Israeli ambassador to the U.S., Danny Ayalon, says that with the Iranian nuclear accord almost a done deal, there are several things that can be done to minimize the damage and ease the tensions over the issue between Jerusalem and Washington. I would say three things need to be done to do, minimize the, the damage. First of all is to work on the compensation that the United States is willing to give and that is to upgrade Israel's defense but also uh, deterrent capabilities vis-a-vis -vis Iran and, and any other uh, coalition of enemies including the terrorists, ISIS, Hezbollah, Hamas. Secondly is to work uh, out a uh, roadmap whereby there will be contingency plans vis-a-vis -vis Iran once and if they breach the, uh, the agreement. Even in the, slightest, in the slightest way, there should be a firm response from the international community. So this has to be worked out now, not when the uh, uh, breach comes out. And the third thing is to mend personal relations. I believe that uh, a meeting in Washington or in New York during the General Assembly of the UN between uh, Mr. Netanyahu and uh, President Obama would be very timely and very important. The new Palestinian town of Rawabi is now set for residency and is accepting its first families. This after years of planning, construction and endless bureaucratic battles with the Israeli and Palestinian administrations. We get more on this report from the media line. Hanadi Abu Zahra turns on the tap in her kitchen and is elated to see water flowing. Water became symbolic of the challenges that had to be overcome for the brand new city Rawabi to open its doors to its residents. I always saw the city in my mind build up, vibrant with people, and today I see it exactly like I saw it many years ago. On a grand entry road, you are met by swaying Rawabi, Palestinian, and Qatari flags. The town center marks the spine, surrounded by residential buildings, a mosque, three schools, and a medical center all under construction. Several months ago, Al-Masri told Media Line that the entire project was in jeopardy due to political setbacks, including lack of Israeli approval for a water pipeline. Are you concerned about the sustainability? This is our main concern right now. Um, after we resolved uh, the political related issues, our main concern is how to create jobs at Rawabi. We are trying to attract technology companies, IT, outsourcing. We have a wealth of human resources in Palestine. Another casualty of the political game was the delay in the schools being completed for this year, while fixation was on water issues. 
Basim Abu Zahra opens the door to his beautiful new but empty apartment. He tells the media line they are excited but not moving yet because the schools will not be ready until next year. Our schools are not ready. That is one of the things that unfortunately had to give in because of lack of funds and because of lack of resources for us to uh, focus um, uh, on uh, the schools as we were focusing on the water issues. The euphoria of the project also uh, 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 calmed down. We no longer have 10 buyers to every apartment. We no longer are choosy of who buys and doesn't buy or where we target. Now we want as many people to come back and buy. Um, however, I'm not so worried by uh, we do have plans and by mid next year we'll get that euphoria back. You showed me a barren hilltop several years ago, never dreaming that it would come to this day. You pointed to the penthouse you were going to live in. Are you there? For my penthouse, I'm not there. I'm six, seven months behind. Uh, but for the project as a whole, I am there. The project is on track. The project's cost topped $1.2 billion, a considerable increase above the original projected $875 million. Making Rawabi a reality has been as bumpy as the hills after which it is named. But for these families moving in, they're hoping for a better future, one many said couldn't happen. From Rawabi, this is Felice Friedson reporting for the Media Line. Danish police closed a major motorway linking Denmark to Germany after hundreds of refugees, including children, marched on the road. The Syrian asylum seekers refused to register in Denmark and are trying to reach Malmo in Sweden, 350 kilometers away. Danish officials also blocked rail lines from Germany so as not to be overwhelmed with refugees trying to pass through the country en route to Sweden. Ferry service between the countries has also been halted as the Danes try to cope with the wave of migrants. Denmark says it's unable to fulfill its obligation to register the refugees and deal with the human flow of aliens passing through the country. The European Parliament meeting in Strasbourg has passed an emergency plan to relocate 40,000 refugees. 498 members voted for the plan with 158 against. The proposal calls for the distribution of migrants who are currently in Italy and Greece among EU member states. Poor countries in Eastern Europe are opposed to the quotas and the debate was filled with emotion. We need to realize, to conclude, as Europeans, that this is not just a time for emotions. That is the easy part. Let me be cynical. As politicians, we are not requested to express our emotions. We are requested to take decisions that are consistent and coherent with our emotions and be strong on that. Emotions are not enough. We need to act. And this is the time. Closing the borders and sending everyone back would mean that we take leave of our most fundamental values as Europeans. It would also mean that we would act in clear violation of our legal obligations. Opening the borders and letting everyone in would mean that we would put an end to the European social model as we know it because it could not support. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry says that the United States is committed to taking in more Syrian refugees, but he declined to give a number. Senate critics are calling on the Obama administration to take a more active role in the crisis. Uh, I just met with members this morning. Uh, we are committed to increasing the number of refugees that we take, and we are looking hard at the number that we can specifically uh, manage with respect to the crisis in Syria and Europe in their migration today. Our government is doing what it has sadly done too often in the past. We're ceding our strength and averting our eyes. We try to comfort our gu guilty consciences by telling ourselves that we're not doing nothing, but it is a claim made in bad faith. For everyone concedes that nothing we are doing is equal to the horrors we face. Long live the Queen. 89-year-old Queen Elizabeth has recorded a special place in history by becoming the longest reigning monarch in the history of the British Empire. The Queen passed the 63 years, 7 months, 2 days, 16 hours, and 23 minutes set by her great-grandmother, Queen Victoria. Elizabeth took the moment in stride while dedicating a railway line in Scotland.
Many, including you, First Minister, have also kindly noted another significance attaching to today. Although it is not one to which I have ever aspired, inevitably, a long life can pass by many milestones. My own is no exception. But I thank you all and the many others at home and overseas for your touching messages of great kindness. Russia has admitted for the first time that it has military experts in Syria. The official confirmation from Moscow comes after weeks of speculation that there has been a growing presence of Russian army and navy personnel spotted in areas of Syria controlled by forces loyal to President Assad. The Kremlin spoke of military experts who are instructing the Syrians in the use of Russian military systems and said that Moscow would consider additional military measures needed for fighting terrorists in Syria if deemed necessary. NATO says that it is alarmed by the increased Russian presence. So I am uh, concerned about reports about uh, increased uh, Russian military presence in, uh, in Syria. Uh, that will not uh, contribute to solve the conflict. Uh, I think it's important to now support all efforts to find a political solution uh, to the conflict in Syria. And we support very much the efforts by the UN to try to find a political solution to the conflict in, uh, in, uh, in Syria. Two treasure hunters who reported that they found a World War II Nazi train have confronted media skeptics. Piotr Koper and Andreas Schrichter described how they allegedly found the train in southwest Poland and informed the authorities of its location. The train is rumored to be hiding treasures looted by Nazi Germany and spirited away, carrying gems and guns ahead of advancing Soviet Red Army forces. According to the treasure hunters, the train is buried underground. Polish officials have been checking the claim and say that there is almost certainly a buried train where the men say, but they could not predict the cargo. Back here at home, the heavy sandstorm that has plagued the country continued today for the third consecutive day, triggering a record-breaking high of electricity consumption. Figures released by the Israel Electric Corporation show that most Israelis tried to stay inside and keep cool, and by yesterday afternoon, electricity usage broke an all-time record, even surpassing last month's scorching heat wave. The thick yellowish-brown dust is still visible around most parts of the country. However, meteorologists predict that it will gradually decrease by Friday afternoon. The Environmental Protection Ministry also recorded an all-time high in the levels of air pollution that were reported to be at their worst in 75 years during the storm. The ministry today reissued health warnings advising the public against spending time outside for extended periods and to avoid any excessive outdoor physical activity. A fire on the outskirts of Jerusalem led to the closing of Highway No. 1 this morning, causing major traffic jams on routes leading to, in and out of the capital for over two hours. In Moza, a blaze raged throughout the morning, and residents of the area were instructed to evacuate their homes. Dozens of firefighting units were on site and managed to control but not yet extinguish the flames. The fire was apparently caused by a truck that burst into flames on the highway and spread to the nearby community. In financial news, the shekel was down against all major foreign currencies, while share prices on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange were also down in end-of-week trading. Here's a look at the late afternoon numbers. Returning to the weather, and the dust is supposed to settle gradually by Sunday, but temperatures will remain hotter than normal over the weekend, with heat wave conditions continuing across the country. Here are the highs and lows for the next 24 hours at home and abroad. And that's all for this newscast. Aaron Viner will be here tomorrow with more news from Israel and abroad. Until then, I'm Laura Cornfield, wishing you a great weekend and shalom from Jerusalem.